everybody. Thank you all for coming down tonight. We are live from Books and Books in Coral Gables, Florida, through the generous support of the Knight Foundation. So a note to our internet audience watching at home, if you're interested in a copy of tonight's book, we can ship it to wherever you are in the United States free of charge. Just call the number on your screen. This evening, Books and Books is very happy to welcome Mr. David W. Bianchi and his new book, Blue Chip Kids, What Every Child and Parent Should Know About Money, Investing, and the Stock Market. Mr. Bianchi is an attorney with the law firm of Stuart Tillman Fox Bianchi and Kane right here in Miami. In Miami. He graduated magna cum laude from Tufts University with a BA in economics and earned his law degree from Boston College Law School. With this book, he brings us a fun and easy to understand introduction to the world of money and investing for kids and parents. This hands-on resource demystifies the basic principles about money matters and shows what it takes to spend, save, and invest wisely. Here to tell us more about it, please give a very warm welcome to Mr. David W. Bianchi. Well, uh, thank you all very much for uh, being here. This is um, not something that I ever, ever imagined, to be perfectly honest. I uh, never thought that I'd write a book. If there was ever such a thing as an accidental author, I am an accidental author. I didn't sit down one night and say, I'm going to write a book. The genesis for this book was uh, very, very modest. As you, most of you know, uh, Julie and I have one child, Trent, a boy who was 12 years old at the time. And despite the fact that he goes to a very good school, uh, I looked at the curriculum that he was getting, I looked at what he was going to get in the years to come, and they were not going to teach anything about money. And I personally think that that's a huge mistake. I think if you can be taught to dissect a frog, you can be taught about money. If you can taught a, be taught about geology, you should be taught about money. Because I think it's the one life skill that you need that's going to last forever. And it's so intuitively obvious to me, yet we don't really teach it. And I don't understand why. So I decided that I would write some stuff for Trent that I would give to him and have him read. And I sat down about a year and a half ago, took this little computer, and I'd come home at night, and I'd sit in the chair, and I would just type anything that came to mind that I thought a 12-year-old child should know about money investing in the stock market. And I had no grand plan, no agenda, no list of topics. I just started typing stuff. And my plan was to type 10 pages, put a staple in it, and have him read it. And no one would see it but him. And I got to the 10th page, and I had some more things I thought he should know about, so I ended up at the 20th page. And uh, never having been accused of running out of things to say, by the time I got to the 20th page, I thought of some more things, and I got to the 30th page. And one thing led to another, and I had, according to my computer, because they do this word count on the computer, I had something like 140 pages. So I then thought, well, there's not a chance that he's going to read this because <laughs> I live in the real world and I know what it's like to get kids to read stuff and he's not going to read it. But I knew that he absolutely loved this series of books called Diary of a Wimpy Kid. He would devour these books the day they came out. And the cool thing about the series of books was that they've got these cartoons throughout the whole book. And they, kids can speed read it, and they like it. So I thought, all right, I'll put some cartoons in here. <laughs> so I went to the web, and I did some research on how I go about hiring an illustrator. And there are tons of them uh, all around the place. You don't know one from the other when you go to the internet. But I found a guy who was in Canada that has a website with all of his illustrations. And he looked really good. So I got in touch with him. And I said, you know, I don't know how many I'm going to want. Maybe I'll want 20. So can you draw him, uh, some stuff if I tell you what I want? And he, this is all by email. So he wrote back. He says, oh, sure. I said, great. So here's my first one. 
that I want. And he wrote back and said, well, <laughs> before we get to the first one, we have to do a little business. <laughs> and the business was that I needed to sign a five-page contract, and I had to pay $7,000 for the first illustration. So I thought, you've got to be kidding me. You must be kidding. So I then went to other places on the web to find an illustrator, and it was kind of like more of the same. So I said, forget this. And then all of a sudden, a light bulb went off in my head. And I remembered that my brother uh, has a son who at the time was in 11th grade in, in Connecticut school. And he loves to draw. And he's a super great, great guy. Kyle is his name, Kyle Bianchi. And he's the nicest, nicest guy, and he's a great artist. So I sent him an email. And my plan was I wanted 20 illustrations. So somebody, I said, Kyle, how about drawing some stuff for me for this uh, thing I'm doing for Trent? And, uh, and I'll pay you. And he said, within three seconds, I got this email back. Absolutely, I want to do it. <laughs> so I said, OK, here's how much I'll pay you. And I told him, because I thought I'd be generous, because I only want 20. So we made a deal. And I said, all right, here's the first drawing I want. I want three kids walking down the st uh, Wall Street with the New York Stock Exchange on the right-hand side. They're going to carry briefcases. I want money coming out of the briefcases. And here's the perspective that I want. And I sent him an email. And two nights later, I get back a drawing. And it was close to what I wanted, but not exactly. So I shoot back an email. I say, you got to change this. you got to change that. Blah, blah, blah. Two nights later, I get an email back. It's got I said, bingo, we're there. We're done with the first one. I, th I think I have 19 more to go. So I wrote him another email. I said, OK, the next one is uh, two kids are doing this. Blah, blah. And he would do it. And we would go back and forth. Well, it turns out that I didn't do 20. I did 165. <laughs> And because I'm such a good guy, I did not renegotiate the contract. <laughs> so his first year of college was basically covered. <laughs> and that was OK with me, because he's such a good guy. I, but I had, didn't have the guts to say, Kyle, this is a little ridiculous. But he, he was so responsive and so good, I was happy to do it. So he, he did all these cartoons. So then I incorporated him into the manuscript, and my plan was to three-hole punch it, put it in a vinyl notebook, and I was going to give it to Trent as like a Christmas present. That was my plan. And then I thought, eh, maybe what I'll do is I'll go to a local print shop and for fun, and I'll slap a cover on it, like a real book at a local print shop, and I'll do it that way. It'll be more, look more like a book. And I had extra copies made. I had like 20 copies made. I brought it home. And I gave out a couple of copies. I gave a copy, I think, to the Talishis, or my super-duper next-door neighbors. I gave them a copy. I gave a copy to some people in the office, a few other people, and never thinking anything of it. And then I heard from people, you know, my other friend wants one, and my cousin wants one, and my, my cousin's neighbor wants one. And, and I thought, we don't, we don't have any. So, and then somebody said, oh, you should publish this. So. I never even thought of it, never dreamed of it. So I went on the web to research how to publish a book. And if you do this research, you'll just forget about trying to publish a book, because <laughs> it is so discouraging. They tell you, your odds are like one in a million. You can't speak to the publishing companies unless you have an agent. So then I Googled agents. And then I find out that they all have specialties. And this one does fiction, and this one does mysteries, and this one does gardening. And I'd have to find somebody who does whatever this is. And then you go to their websites and they say to you, if you send me your manuscript, maybe I'll get back to you in four months and tell you whether or not I'm willing to speak to you, and maybe I'll represent you and maybe I won't. I thought, no, I'm not doing this. I don't have the patience for this. So I decided I wasn't going to publish a book at all. And then I said to my wife, Julia, who's way more connected than I am, I said, Julia, don't you know somebody in the publishing business? So she got on the computer and sent out an email to the, um, her network of women uh, through Tiffany Circle of the Red Cross, women from all around the country uh, who were all very accomplished. And she sent out an email and uh, said, does anybody know a publisher? And within a day, 
She had a response from uh, a Tiffany Circle member in San Francisco who's a money manager at J.P. Morgan who said, I know somebody in the publishing business. And she shot off an email to somebody uh, at Wiley, the publishing company. And her friend at Wiley, I think to be nice, within 24 hours sent an email to me saying, oh, my friend wants me to look at your manuscript, so please send me your manuscript. So I emailed it to her as a PDF, never thinking anything of it. And four days later, she got back and said, Wiley wants to publish the book. <laughs> so I didn't know what to do then. It's like, be careful what you ask for, you know? You might get it. It's like the dog chasing the car. What's he going to do when he gets the car? So, so we ended up uh, entering into a contract. We got a contract, and Wiley uh, published the book, and away we went. And then it was, the uh, question was, well, now what do we do? How do we, you know, what do you do with a book? As never being an author, I didn't know how you go about trying to sell it. So I, uh, I got a PR person, and I got a social media person, and all of a sudden, uh, much to my utter surprise, the interest level in this thing just like took off. And the first thing they did was they booked me on a, a satellite media tour where I was on television from San Diego to Boston, 35 cities, uh, and broadcast all over the place. And the reaction to the book in every single city was exactly the same. And that was essentially, how come I didn't have this when I was a kid? How come we don't teach this in school? Uh, I'm going to get this for my kids, but I'm going to read it first because I need to know more about this too. That's what everybody said. And then people had heard about this and it started to get a little traction. And we got this email uh, out of the blue uh, from Barnes and Noble. And they, they said to us, um, our number one store in the country is on Fifth Avenue in New York City. And we want to put your book in the window of the Fifth Avenue store in New York City. Um, and so that's where it is tonight. It's in the window of Fifth Avenue store in New York. And I flew up to see it and have pictures taken. <laughs> and because that wasn't going to, I'm not going to do that again. And I met with the guy. I met with the guy who runs the store, and he was amazing. He says, look, normally we only, they only have three books in the window up there, and you pay to get into that window, but we didn't pay. And he said, we've got all kinds of money books for kids that have paraded through here over the years, but they all sort of miss the mark for one reason or another, and we never thought that they're just right. We think this book is just right, and that's why we decided to put it into the window. So then Barnes & Noble did a test market for the book. They put it in 20 stores around the country. And three days ago, they sent us an email saying that based on that test, they're now rolling it out to 400 stores around the country. Wow. <laughs> and it, it goes on and on. So then uh, I've been to speak to groups about it because they've asked me to come speak. And I thought, you know, it's my impression that young people don't know enough about this, but maybe I'm wrong. Maybe it's just me. Maybe I'm the only guy who thinks that young people don't know enough about money investing in the stock market. So I decided to do a little test to entertain you. And what I did was, last Sunday, I got a camera crew, and we went out into the streets of Coconut Grove and South Miami, and we stopped young people at random on the sidewalks who would talk to us. And by the way, to be under full disclosure, I had to induce them to speak to me by promising them a free book if they would stop and talk to me. <laughs> and we went around and we interviewed people to see what they know about money investing in the stock market. So what I would like to do is have you meet your neighbors, okay? Liz, will you push the space bar, please? I want to ask you some questions to see what you know about money, investing, and the stock market, okay? Okay. How old are you? Just tell us how old you are. I'm 14. Tell me, what's the difference between a credit card and a debit card? I have no idea. What's the difference between simple interest and compound interest? Mm, I don't know. 
tell me what a stock is. Something you invest in. What's the stock market? Um, where all the stocks are. How many stocks are there in the S&P 500? And I'm only focused on stocks. I have no idea. How many stocks are there in the Dow 30? And again, I'm only focused on stocks. I have no idea. <laughs> What's the difference between simple interest and compound interest? I don't know. I actually just graduated from UM. I'm about to be a graduate student, but so like, I'm studying psychology, not finance, so I don't really know. Okay. Um, what is a stock? A stock is when you buy a little bit off of a market, like say Disney or something, and then you get it back depending on how much money they make. You get the stock back? I don't. Okay. What? It's gonna be on Jimmy Kimmel. What? is an index fund. Oh, that's, that's here. What is a mutual fund? Mutual fund is when you have funds and funds and then you go like this. And they come together sort of mutually. Exactly. What is the difference between simple interest and compound interest? I have no idea. What is the S&P 500? I have no idea. What is... That sounds so familiar. <laughs> that sounds familiar. Um, um, do I don't know. I feel like it's like an award thing. Like it's a company that says something about the standards of something. I'm telling you, I think I know. I think I know. All right. Uh, and you may. Uh, what is the Russell 2000? Mm, I have no idea. You got me there. No idea? No idea. How many stocks are there, and I'm only talking about stocks, in the S&P 500? I have no idea. How many stocks are there in the Dow 30, and I'm only talking about stocks? 30? I'm not familiar with, like, the stock market. <laughs> I should, is it something people should be investing in? But do you think that young people ought to at least know about it, learn about it? Yeah, I think it's important to invest your money from an early age. Are you getting that sort of education in, in high school? No. No, I was actually a business major in finance in my magnet school in high school, and I didn't really learn much about the stock market at all. Can you just tell me your ages? That's all I want, please. 19. 21. All right, so tell me, what's the difference between a credit card and a debit card? <laughs> Don't ask you these questions. What's the difference between simple interest and compound interest? Don't know. What is a price earnings ratio? I don't know. I'm not sure. How many stocks are there in the S&P 500? And I'm only talking about stocks. I have an idea. First year, I'm like in accounting right now. It's like, so I haven't learned anything about financial anything. You think it's important for uh, young people to learn it? Definitely. How old are you? Uh, almost 14. Almost 14. Almost 14, great. What's uh, the difference between simple interest and compound interest? I have no idea. Do you know? No. No. What's the difference between being long a stock and short a stock? Long stock is you have a lot of money, and short stock is uh, you're broke. <laughs> All right. Uh, any idea? Uh, short stock is you're lacking money. So, no, yeah, I don't really. How many stocks are there in the S&P 500? And I'm only talking about stocks. 500? Uh, are you sure? Not at all. <laughs> is that just a guess? Yes. Any idea how many stocks there are in the S&P 500? 700? 700? <laughs> okay. How many stocks are there in the Russell 2000? And I'm only talking about stocks. 1,500. 1,000. 1,000, okay. What is a price-earnings ratio? Price-earning ratio. The amount of money you get paid a month? 
Can I ask you your ages, please? 15, 17. What's the difference between a debit card and a credit card? Um, I'm not sure. What's uh, the difference between simple interest and compound interest? No, no idea. <laughs> not at all. No idea? Okay. What's the difference between being long a stock and short a stock? No, I, no. no. Nope. <laughs> no go? Yeah. <laughs> all right. How many stocks are there in the S&P 500? And I'm only talking about stocks. Is it 500? 500. Yeah. Are you guessing or do you know? I, I'm guessing, yeah. What is a price earnings ratio? Um, how much something costs to how much you earn? Uh, I'm going to go with that one. Yeah. yeah. That really <laughs> Can I ask you how old you are, please? Sure. 19. What is an index fund? I do not know. What's a mutual fund? Uh, I don't know either. How many stocks are there in the S&P 500? And I'm only talking about stocks, nothing else. Couldn't tell you. What is a P.E. ratio? You're stumping me with all the questions. What is a price earnings ratio? Isn't that how much you earn and how much the is? It's kind of like the minimum wage. What is that it? Or like the, the how much you make compared to how much you pay in a, in a I'm not sure actually. Okay, I just gave you a copy of Blue Chip Kids, which just came out. It's uh, for young people about money investing in the stock market. That's a great idea. It's about time that uh, we put into the educational system, start teaching our kids of all classes, of all class levels, wealthy kids, middle class kids, poor kids. They should get into their psyche, into their minds. They should know how money works. So when they become adults, they become better productive with money and with savings. To me, if you were my own kids, they're gonna learn about this from the very early years. That's the only way you can uh, you can make a difference in how you handle your wealth or build your wealth when, uh, when you become an adult. And what line of work are you in? I work in uh, financial analysis for a major corporation, and um, you know, it, it really, uh, I think everybody should know about investments, especially when uh, buying a house, which is everybody's goals. Everybody should know how that works, how diff uh, market rates work. Etc. So this is a good step uh, to teaching the kids from a very early age. That's it. <laughs> that's a little eye opener, is it not? <laughs> um, but that's and I, by the way, you should see the stuff I cut. <laughs> there was a lot more. I had much more. I, I cut it down to eight minutes. But I think you, I think you get the idea. Um, so here's, I think here's the bottom line. Um, we're doing a really poor job in this country of educating young people about money and investing. Really poor. And we need to do a much better job. And uh, what I've learned from this whole experience is almost everybody agrees. It's one of those topics that it doesn't matter whether you're a Republican or a Democrat or an Independent or who knows what. Everybody seems to agree we need to do a better job in terms of financial literacy education in the United States. And if you're into the data, if you like to study data as opposed to just your gut feeling, the data backs it up. I mean, look at what's going on in this country with student debt. We've got $1.1 trillion of outstanding student debt in this, uh, in this country. And that money was taken out when these kids were teenagers without any regard to how they were ever going to pay it back. And they're not going to be able to pay it back. And now they're getting out of college, they don't have uh, good jobs, they're not making much money, they have to start paying the money back and they don't know how because they, they, it's too much. The average student with uh, debt in this country is $26,000 per student. And what it's doing is it's um, inhibiting household formation, it's inhibiting housing sales, just read the articles, it's inhibiting housing sales, so even if you think to yourself, you know, this is not my kid, or this is not us, or we have money, so it really doesn't matter to me because that's somebody else's kid, it affects everybody because it has macroeconomic consequences for the entire economy. Because housing is one of the big drivers of economic growth. And when housing is hurting because young people can't afford to buy houses, it slows down the overall economy, which affects even the people with money who have investments. 
So you should care, even though it may not directly impact your own household. So it's a big problem. I think that um, before I close, uh, people have said to me, okay, we uh, agree that we need to do a better job of teaching young people about money, but how do you go about it? Uh, the concept's good, but how do you really get a kid to pay attention and learn it? And I think there are a number of different ways. And I think one of the big problems that we do as parents is that we are selling our young people short. We think they're too young to learn it now. We think they won't be interested. And we think they're not smart enough to understand it right now. And we're wrong on all counts. Totally wrong. I started with uh, Trent. Uh, and when I had this book put together, and what we do is uh, we read 15 pages of the book at a time. That's it. Because there's large type and it's got cartoons, you can read 15 pages in a maximum of 15 minutes. And then we spend 10 minutes talking about the 15 pages. And we're done for the day. That's it. A couple days later, we read another 15 pages. And we spend 10 minutes talking about it. We've now worked our way through the book twice. And if he were here, he could tell you what GDP is. He knows what puts and calls are. He knows what uh, PE ratios are, et cetera. Because he's been through the book and he has absorbed it in bite-sized pieces. And the book is simple, simple, simple. That's why it's in the window of Barnes & Noble in New York. They told me they thought it was the best presentation of this subject matter for young people that they have seen, which is why they did what they did with it. If, if you will s spend the time to have your son or your daughter or your grandchildren just read it in bite-sized pieces and then spend some time talking to them about what they've just read, you'll be shocked by what they know. They will learn it and they'll be so much smarter about money than they are now. And this applies to college kids just like it applies to 12-year-olds and 18-year-olds and 25-year-olds. I had somebody say to me, my dear, dear friend Bernard Darty, who uh, the book is dedicated to, he said to me uh, in the early days when he saw this, he says, you know, parents are going to claim they're buying this for their kids, but they're going to secretly read it themselves. <laughs> and he's right, because the, if truth be known, parents can learn from it too. And if you're like me, my favorite book is a book with pictures. Okay, I like, I like pictures, and I like cartoons, and I like big type, and I don't want a college textbook. So this is a way to learn something even for adults. So there, there's no downside to financial literacy education, none. And this is really gathering steam. We have uh, conversations that are going to start to try to get this into the schools. St. Stephen's uh, in Coconut Grove called. They're going to use it uh, in the fall for their fifth grade class. Um, it's, uh, yeah, that's a, a tribute to them. Uh, we're going to try to uh, get it into the Dade County school system. We're going to try to get it into the other private schools. We've had phone calls from other places. They're interested in getting it into the schools because it presents the information in a way that people can understand it and they're not going to be bored by it. If they're bored, nobody's going to read it. But if it's interesting and you, if you have a commitment from the parent and the teacher or parent or the teacher, and the kids, the, yes, I think this is important enough that I'm willing to spend 30 minutes twice a week. I'm willing to spend 30 minutes twice a week. In a month or two, you'll be shocked by what they know. So, uh, thank you really. It's very, very nice of you to all be here tonight. It's a really a personal honor for me for you all to be here. Thanks so much for all your great support. I hope you like the book and let's have some fun, okay? Yeah, I don't want to take any questions from the audience. There's plenty of time for questions oh. and comments from the crowd if we want. Oh. Uh, are there any questions? Anybody got a question? Yeah, we've got a question right here. So did Trent negotiate any kind of inspiration fee? He did. <laughs> His inspiration fee is every five minutes of this book, he gets, I think it's 15 minutes on World of Warcraft. <laughs> so, yeah. Ah, yeah. Uh, we haven't done that yet. We've been asked to do that, uh, but I have to speak to the publisher and see where we're going to go with that. Oh, and also, we're, uh, we have talks underway to uh, create a television program around it. So, yeah. So, 
But I'll tell you, the one thing you can do, uh, the one thing you could do as you go back into your community is to advocate for this at your schools. You know, the schools will respond if the parents want it. But if the parents are silent, thinking somebody else is going to do it, they're going to think, eh, but you should go back. I spoke to a couple, uh, two days ago at Gibraltar Bank to a bunch of their people. And they were so enthusiastic about the subject matter. And they came up to me later, people who were there, and said they're going to go back to their schools and try to convince their schools to actually take the book and incorporate it into a class. And I think that, that, that's really what should be done. Because if, imagine what kids would know if they spent one semester with this book and really had people talk to them about the subject matter. Imagine what they would know. So, yeah, Liz. David, are you going to go online and do tutorials online with the book? Yeah, I thought about that. Uh, somebody, uh, somebody has asked me to do um, little YouTube videos about uh, the different topics. So, uh, I may do that. I might do that. Yeah, so, you yeah. Have follow up text in mind? I, I don't because I think there's so much more that can be done with this. I don't want to take my eye off the ball. Kid spends a month and is really into it. Yeah. What happens after that? Oh well, then he can. You know, there are so many other more sophisticated ways well, to get this yeah. information. You know, there are so many. Uh, you can go to Khan Academy and and get it at a much more sophisticated level. You know. So, okay. Thank you all very very much. Thanks. All right, folks. So if there are no more questions, then we have blue chip kids for sale at the counter in the front room over there. Mr. Bianchi is going to sign over there at the table to the left of the screen, and the reception continues. Thanks very much. Thank mm -hmm. you.